Hello and welcome back to the Timur Podcast, a show that investigates the life, conquests, character, and legacy of Amir Timur, or as we simply call him on this show, Timur. And in this episode, we are going to take a brief break from the narrative of Timur's life to instead look into one of our primary sources on the story of Timur. This is our second episode on this new portion of the show that covers the sources on Timur, a section that I creatively call The Sources. Okay, so let's get into this. Today we are going to talk about the primary source entitled Timur the Great Amir, or it's sometimes called A History of the Life and Conquests of Timur. And there are a few other titles floating around, but it is a biography of Timur. And the author behind this work is a man most commonly called Ahmad ibn Arab Shah, although sometimes you'll see Muhammad ibn, Amir, ibn Arab Shah, and that's not incorrect. But we will refer to him as his name is usually abbreviated to, and that is just Arab Shah. Now, Arab Shah's account is tied with Yazdi's Zafarnama as my two favorite sources on the life of Timur. In fact, if you ever want to read a primary account, I wouldn't be able to pick between either one to recommend to you. Instead, you'll get the most out of them if you read them together side by side. Because where Yazdi goes out of his way to portray Timur as a victorious hero, a man who will save his people and rule with justice, and as a man we should all aspire to be more like... Arab Shah gives us the exact opposite. To Arab Shah, Timur is the embodiment of evil. And as such, although both authors would no doubt be appalled by this idea, these sources complement each other really well. They fill in gaps the other source chose to leave out, and they tend to balance out the biases of the other writer, at least a bit. In a few minutes, we'll talk more about Arab Shah's account of Timur, but first we need to look at Arab Shah himself. And to do this, we need to skip three and a half decades forward from where we are now in the narrative of Timur's life. So right now, if you've listened to this week's episode, Timur and Hussein have finally gained control of Transoxiana. Actually, that's that's a lie because we didn't get that far. I wrote this episode before I wrote that episode. No, we, we just heard about the siege of Samarkand and how the people, maybe the Sarbadars, had risen up to fight against the Mughal invaders. But for now, let's travel forward 35 years or so to the year 1400. The year is 1400. Timur is the sole leader of a gigantic empire and leader of a seemingly invincible military machine. And from Central Asia, Timur has moved westwards, crushing and absorbing all the petty Persian states that had risen up after the Ilkhanate had fallen. And although some of these kingdoms put up some good resistance, none of them were able to withstand Timur. And we'll talk more about all of this, of course, once we get there, but this is just a very, very simplified retelling so that we can get to Arab Shah. Anyway, as Timur's armies travel further and further westwards, the buffer zones between Timur and two other powerful factions becomes smaller and smaller. In western Anatolia and parts of eastern Europe, a new rising power had been solidifying an empire. This is the land of the Ottoman Turks, led by the fearless and incredibly talented Sultan Bayezid the Thunderbolt. And Bayezid is watching Timur's forces get closer and closer to his borders and is preparing for the worst. But meanwhile, to the south, the powerful Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt is also worrying quite a bit about Timur's approach. And at this point, the Crusaders had been pushed out of the Levant, so the Mamluks controlled territory stretching from Egypt through Palestine, Lebanon, and most of Syria. So you have three very powerful factions swallowing swallowing up their weaker neighbors and now coming face to face with one another, all of them a bit nervous about what the others might do. Now, Timur is no dummy, and he knows that a very logical strategic choice for the other two factions would be for them to ally with one another against him. That is, an Ottoman and Mamluk defensive alliance to keep Timur from attacking either one of them. If Timur should attack the Ottomans, the Mamluks could attack his flank, and if Timur were to attack the Mamluks, the Ottomans could do the same. And thus, Timur decides to attack before this defensive coalition could actually be formed. In 1399 and 1400, Timur's armies sweep into Mamluk-controlled Syria, with Timur at the head of the army. And the Mamluks are largely taken off guard by this. They thought that they would have some time to prepare, but now it's too late. The Timurids are here. The two most powerful cities in Syria at this time, both under Mamluk control, were the cities of Aleppo and Damascus. And we'll talk more about these invasions and these cities, of course, but for now, let's just say that Aleppo fell to Timur and was brutally sacked. And then soon after that, Timur was outside the walls of Damascus, demanding that the city surrender. 
Timur's siege of Damascus is absolutely fascinating because there are some really interesting politics that happen here. Damascus was the capital of and greatest city of Syria and thus was reasonably defended, but the Mamluk leaders knew that they probably wouldn't be able to withstand a siege by Timur. So interesting politics arise with some people saying we should surrender to Timur as long as he agrees to spare the city. Others saying, no, we should fight. And others saying, we should wait for the coming Mamluk relief force. And then there's all sorts of people in between. And what makes this scenario even more interesting is that there was an Islamic scholar and traveler present here in Damascus. And he was chosen to be one of the diplomats to go out and meet with Timur to try and figure out some sort of resolution. This was a man named Ibn Khaldun, and we've mentioned him before. He was a Tunisian scholar, explorer, economist, adventurer, scientist, historian, and definitely one of, one of the most brilliant men of his era. And having left Tunisia to explore the Islamic world, he traveled eastwards through Libya, Egypt, the Levant, and finally ended up in Damascus. And now, <laughs> talk about wrong place at the wrong time, because he, here he is in the city when Timur arrives. Thankfully for us, for him, and for all of humankind, Ibn Khaldun survived the siege and continued to produce some incredible works. And these works include some phenomenal accounts and descriptions of his meetings with Timur and of Timur's previous exploits. Now, we'll cover Ibn Khaldun at a later time. Uh, I'm somewhat of an Ibn Khaldun fanboy. I, I think his name is a name everybody should know, so we'll talk a lot about him more later. But anyway, let's get back to the Siege of Damascus. So some political and diplomatic games take place, but the end result is that eventually Timur is unsatisfied with what he's been offered to him, and his, order, his soldiers are ordered to destroy the city. And soon enough, the wrath of Timur was unleashed upon the streets and the homes of Damascus. And I do have to pause here to, to warn you that what I'm about to tell you, what Arab Shah is about to tell us, is greatly disturbing. Traumatic, even. So if you're somebody who might be greatly disturbed by the grisly details of a city being sacked, you may not want to continue this episode, or maybe just skip the next few minutes. Okay, with that said, very soon after Timur orders his men to attack the city, they breach the walls and are soon into the city of Damascus. And as the soldiers are racing through the streets, cutting down anybody in their path, as the dark smoke of destruction turns the sky black, amid the looting and the raping and the torturing and the enslaving and the slaughtering, amid this whirlwind of unimaginable nightmares, an 11-year-old boy hid from the soldiers and watched everything. This boy was Ahmed ibn Arab Shah. Born in 1389 to an Arab family living in Damascus, Arab Shah's childhood was forever shattered when Timur took the city in 1400. Writing his account of Timur's life 30 or so years later, this is how Arab Shah described the Timurid sacking of his home city. Then he let his soldiers plunder at will, seize any they wished as prisoners, destroy suddenly and slaughter, burn and drag into bondage without restraint. And those evil unbelievers suddenly fell upon men, torturing, smiting, and laying waste as stars fall from the sky. And excited and swollen, they slaughtered and smote and raged against Muslims and their allies as ravaging wolves rage against teeming flocks of sheep and did things which to do is unseemly and which is not acceptable to record and relate. And they took matrons prisoners, uncovered the veils of veiled women, afflicting great and small alike with every kind of torture, men suffering things whose some cannot be reckoned. By scorching at the fire the fine ore of mankind, they drew therefrom the purest gold, and exacting precious things from men by devising various torture, they achieved wonders." and separated mothers from their children, and souls from bodies. And everyone that nursed forgot her nursing, and everyone received the reward of what he had done or had not done. And men fled from brothers, mothers, fathers, friends, and children, and the powerful and noble became filth, and the famous and great became despised. And affliction was complete, and judgment was shared by all. And I call God to witness that those days were a sign among the signs of the last day." Then Arab Shah continues to describe the great fire that broke out and destroyed the little that was left in the city. 
And this fire lasted night and day, and burned up what remained of precious things and souls. And the tongue of fire wiped out what was written in the tablets of the city, and towards evening in those pleasant mansions no more was heard of vain conversations or whispering. And in the morning the city appeared mowed down, as though yesterday it had not teemed, even after booty had been taken out and bundles put on beasts of burden. And then a bit later he continues... Then that tormentor departed, and his cloud of calamities pouring forth constant storms withdrew. The fire was a grievous affliction and deadly blow, for it devoured those within the city for want of help. Think, therefore, how much perished of buildings, precious goods, and properties. The dogs also rushed to devour the flesh of dead citizens, and none dared enter the mosque of the Umayyads. But Timur went forward and on his torturous way and returned to his path of violence, which he had chosen instead of a straight and royal road. And now his armies filled the countries on every side with fear of him. The fear seized the whole world. There have been times, several times, while telling the story of Timur, when I've caught myself being swept along with his narrative. And by that I mean, at times, while forgetting the larger picture during his early life, there have been times where I'm almost cheering for him. His rise to power is so compelling in so many ways, his struggle against countless difficulties is almost inspiring, but then I have to catch myself and remember who we're talking about here. This is Timur. This is the man who will wipe out 5% of the world's population. Before Hitler or Stalin, it was Genghis Khan and Timur who historians judged the evilest of men against. And this is just one of the many reasons why Arab Shah's account is so valuable to us. Arab Shah is one of the many, one of the tens of millions of people who suffered directly at the blood-covered hands of Timur. And these millions of people, Arab Shah is one of the very few who not only survived, but who managed to write about it later on. His descriptions of the sacking of Damascus are invaluable because he was there, in the streets, watching as everything he knew, as an 11-year-old boy, everything was dashed to pieces. The account of Timur that Arab Shah will later write does have its flaws. A lot of his information is question questionable. He gets details wrong on occasion, but his description of the sacking of Damascus is coming solely from the memories of a traumatized child. A boy who witnessed things that hopefully you and I will never be able to even imagine. But thankfully for Arab Shah, for the memory of those at Damascus, and for us, this was not the end of his story. As we will see many times with Timur, if a city opposed him, it was brutally destroyed. And actually, apparently there is still a plaza in the modern city of Damascus that is called the Tower of Heads. For it was at this location where Timur's soldiers constructed a giant tower, a pyramid of decapitated heads of those who had been massacred. But although whole populations would mostly be put to the sword, slavery was also a necessary economic pillar supporting much of medieval warfare. And while most of Arab Shah's community was killed, including probably his own father, he, his mother, and his sisters were spared. Spared, of course, from the slaughter, but not from slavery. They, along with thousands of others, were marched in chains out of the smoldering ruins to various, often horrific, fates. Arab Shah and his family were taken back to the city of Samarkand, Timur's capital, where most likely they were separated and chosen to fulfill very various roles in the society of Samarkand. And from this crowd of newly arrived slaves, Arab Shah was chosen to be educated. Now, we'll talk more about Timur's system of sparing and congregating the brightest and most skilled individuals from the realms he would conquer, but for now, Arab Shah was identified as being an intelligent, impressionable youth, and was thus educated and trained as a scholar. Thus, for the next eight years or so, Arab Shah was in Samarkand and being educated by probably some of the best and smartest scholars in much of the world at that time. Arab Shah was taught Persian, Mongolian, among other languages. He was taught history, science, and all sorts of other studies. 
Samarkand, at this time after all, was one of the intellectual headquarters of the world, and through these eight years, no doubt that Arab Shah would have seen Timur returning from his many other conquests, hearing of the new lands that had suffered through what he, Arab Shah, had suffered through only a few years prior. And so, although Arab Shah was now an educated man and promising scholar among the Timurid court, his hatred for Timur only grew with time. And with the death of Timur in the year 1405, and in the ensuing political chaos within the Timurid Empire, Arab Shah eventually leaves Samarkand to find work elsewhere. He travels to what would today be in southwestern Russia and the Ukraine, to the cities of Sarai, Astrakhan, and Kaffa, which were important trading cities, still mostly under the Mongolian remnants present here. Uh, and along these travels, Arab Shah continued to learn from the scholars who were present, and generally stayed in each of these cities a year or two before moving on. By the year 1412, so when Arab Shah was about 23 years old or so, he traveled south to the Ottoman city of Adirne and entered service in the court of the Ottoman Sultan, Sultan, Sultan Mehmed I. And Arab Shah stayed within Ottoman service for about a decade, eventually reaching the position of confidential secretary to the Sultan, which is quite impressive given that Arab Shah was a slave only 15 or so years earlier. While serving the Ottomans, Arab Shah also completed quite a few translations of important works from Arabic to Turkish and Persian, and he also began his biography of Timur about this time. By 1422, Arab Shah had left Ottoman service due to some issues within the Ottoman court, and wanting to see what his home of Damascus was like now, and hoping to settle down somewhere because he had started a family about now, Arab Shah returned to Damascus. This was the first time he had set foot in his home city since 23 years earlier when he had been dragged out of it a slave. By this time, Damascus had rebounded quite a bit and was again a metropolis full of life and trade and people. Arab Shah stayed here for several years but had considerable trouble finding work, especially given his incredible education and experience, this is kind of surprising. But for years, this man who had once been a confidential secretary of the Ottoman Empire and who had been trained by some of the finest scholars of the day, he now found himself resolved to working as a scribe for hire, sitting outside of a, mo a mosque in Damascus, which is quite a step down for Arab Shah. So after a few hard years of living in Damascus, Arab Shah moved south to Egypt to work in the court system there, where he was much more appreciated for his resume. In 1438, he was caught up in a bit of a political conspiracy and actually imprisoned for this, but either because he was found innocent or possibly because the Sultan liked him so much, Arab Shah was released after only a few days in prison. While here in Egypt, Arab Shah continued to produce several works and translations and also finished the work that he is best known for, his biography of Timur. Arab Shah lived here in Egypt for several years until eventually, at the age of 61, he died in Cairo in 1450. Now, the interesting thing about Arab Shah is he has gone down in history pretty much solely for his biography of Timur. And until recently, that's pretty much only when Arab Shah's name would show up in relation to Timur. And his history of Timur is incredibly important, don't get me wrong, that's why we're talking about Arab Shah after all, but he also completed several other important works and translations which recently more and more scholars are becoming interested in. So while Arab Shah is a bit of a forgotten scholar besides his account of Timur, it's exciting that historians are slowly taking more interest in his life. We'll probably see more biographies of Arab Shah written in the future, and I think he definitely deserves this. Another interesting thing about him is that his son was a scholar and historian as well, and apparently wrote a biography of his father. But to this day, we still haven't found this biography. I imagine if we find it, we'll see a huge leap in interest concerning Arab Shah, and I, I hope we do find it, obviously. Okay, but to close, let's talk about Arab Shah's biography of Timur. It's valuable to us for many reasons. First of all, as mentioned earlier, it's an eyewitness account of Timur's invasion of Syria, and in particular the siege and sack of Damascus. And eyewitness accounts are always invaluable to us because... I, I, I didn't write a sentence here explaining why? Okay, no, they're always invaluable to us because it's the words of someone there. Secondly, because of Arab Shah's academic background, he spends a considerable amount of time describing the various scholars in Timur's court. Many of our other sources are more interested in the military side of things, but Arab Shah mentions the academic life to the Timurid court, including many scholars who he probably studied under. 
Thirdly, Arabshaw takes the time to describe in great detail many of the atrocities and what we would call today war crimes carried out by Timur and Timur's army. And this is not surprising at all given Arabshaw's own story, but this acts as a great counter to, say, Yazdi's account of Timur's conquests. First of all, while Arabshaw's account is certainly anti-Timur, he does occasionally admit that Timur was skilled or capable at something. And because Arabshaw would have no reason to include positive traits of Timur, we can, be, we can be fairly certain that he's admitting the truth to us. For example, I know I've used this before, but Arabshaw admits that Timur was fantastic at handling horses and knowing their needs. Additionally, Arab, Arabshaw tells us that Timur was brilliant and spent time with the prominent scholars of the age, or that Timur was unmatched in his military knowledge. These are objective facts that help us navigate through the very biased primary sources on Timur's life. And finally, while Yazdi goes out of his way to tell us just how great and impressive Timur is, Arab Shah takes time to portray Timur in the worst of ways. And to see this, all you have to do is read the chapter titles of Arab Shah's biography. Here are just a few of the chapter titles, or parts of the chapter titles. Of the beginning of his tyranny after he had subdued Transoxiana. The deceitful one advances. The acts of that villain. The threats uttered by that demon. The viper returns to the kingdoms. The cause of his invading Arabian Iraq, though his tyranny needed no reason or cause. This bastard begins to lay waste to Azerbaijan. Of the trickery and fraud which he committed. And it goes on and on, you get the point. I mean, one of the very first sentences of the whole biography is Arab Shah exclaiming, May Allah remove him from the garden of paradise. Thus, Arab Shah's account of Timur is a great counter and balance to our very, our very pro-Timur sources. It's written in a very compelling way, it's generally accurate, especially as the story progresses, and it also includes descriptions of various histories of the region that Timur conquered. And this all makes Arab Shah's account, Timur the Great Amir, one of our best primary sources. But with that, I think that pretty much wraps up our episode on Ahmad ibn Arab Shah. I hope you enjoyed it. I haven't decided what our next primary source episode will cover, or who it will cover, or when it will release, but our regular episodes will of course continue on a weekly basis. So thank you for listening. If you want to reach out to me for any time, for any reason, feel free to email me at timmerpodcast at gmail.com or follow the show on Facebook at TimmerPod or on Twitter at Podcast Timmer. If you're enjoying what we're doing here, a rating or review on whatever listening platform you're using goes a long way. Next episode, we will return to the story of Timur and Hussein to see what happens now that the Siege of Samarkand ended in a way that wasn't too favorable for the Mughals. Join me next time right here on the Timmer Podcast. Mm -hmm.